This is the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast. It's June 2022, and we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the publication of James Joyce's novel Ulysses with this series of podcasts exploring Anthony Burgess's love for it. In this episode, we're looking at Burgess's musical version of Ulysses called Blooms of Dublin, and we've got a lot to share this week. A rare recording of Anthony Burgess being interviewed about the musical from 1982, some new recordings of the music itself which have never been broadcast before, and an interview with the actor Frank Grimes about taking part in the premiere. I'm the Burgess Foundation's Will Carr, and I'm going to tell you the story of Blooms of Dublin. Let's get started. James Joyce was one of the most important influences on Anthony Burgess ever since Burgess first read Ulysses as a 15-year-old schoolboy. This experience shaped his later writing, formally, linguistically, imaginatively, and Burgess's engagement with Joyce and his works became the major artistic challenge of his life. This engagement took many forms. He was terrified as a boy by the Hellfire Sermon in Joyce's novel A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man and Burgess later imitated Joyce with sermons in his own novels, A Clockwork Orange and Tremor of Intent. His first novel, A Vision of Battlements, which was based in part on Burgess's war service in Gibraltar, follows Joyce's use of classical myth to give a structure to his story and to illuminate contemporary concerns. Burgess's epic novel of the 20th century, Earthly Powers, uses Ulysses as a kind of scaffolding, and James Joyce himself appears as a fictional character. And even Burgess's own autobiographies, Little Wilson and Big God and You've Had Your Time, are filled with quotations and allusions to Ulysses and Joyce's other writings. Joyce is always there for Burgess. His writing opened up the possibilities of modern fiction, and he measured himself against his great inspiration. Anthony Burgess also wrote extensive critical commentaries on James Joyce, including a book called Here Comes Everybody, which was a guide for beginners to all of Joyce's work, and Joyce Brick, an introduction to the language of James Joyce, with chapters on dialect, interior monologue, and Joyce's use of slang. Burgess also edited abridged versions of Finnegan's Wake and Ulysses, and all of his publications on Joyce are full of energy and enthusiasm, and they sought to make accessible the challenging work of one of his very favourite writers. One of the most unexpected ways in which Burgess did this was to adapt Ulysses as a stage musical. Nobody else seems to have done this, and on the face of it, it seems to be an absurd project. Ulysses is a complicated, elusive and challenging novel that everyone knows about, but hardly anyone has read. It makes enormous demands on the reader, and has fueled a century of scholarly debate. Hardly anything happens in the book, yet the journey it takes us on is an epic one. How could such a novel be rendered as a musical? Well, let's hear Burgess himself explain it. This is part of an interview on the programme Saturday View, broadcast by the Irish radio station RTE1 in February 1982. The interviewer is Pat Kenny, who asks Burgess why he is visiting Dublin. Burgess first mentions the musical possibilities of Ulysses in 1965, just in passing in his book Here Comes Everybody. 
In August 1971, he said in an interview with the critic Geoffrey Agler that, this is Burgess speaking, I've just completed the book, lyrics and music for a musical of Ulysses I tentatively call Blooms of Dublin. All done in three weeks, quite a record really, but one has to kill the Italian heat somehow. Burgess had the famous Israeli actor Topol in mind to play the lead, Leopold Bloom, and he also considered Zero Mostel, who had read and enjoyed the script. But nothing came of these ideas until 1980, when Burgess decided to turn his stage musical into something suitable for radio. Working with the BBC producer John Tideman, Burgess put together a plan for a co-production with RTE in Ireland and set about orchestrating his piano score. Completed by 1981, the score was performed and recorded in Dublin the following year and broadcast on both networks to mark the centenary of James Joyce's birth. Here's a bit more of Burgess's interview with Pat Kenny, in which he describes how realising this musical was, as he puts it, something of a boyhood dream. But what sort of musical is it? One of the ways to think about it is that it celebrates the popular musical culture in Dublin that Joyce himself celebrates in Ulysses. There are references to more than 300 songs in Ulysses, mostly popular ones of the day, and what Burgess does is write in these traditions and include lots of musical allusions to well-known pieces. Burgess said that what he wanted to do was, and this is him speaking, ensure that the work as a whole stayed close to the tonalities of the music hall. And he also said that he was aiming to write the kind of thing Joyce might have envisaged for his characters. Joyce was the great master of the ordinary, and my music is ordinary enough. So he claims a kind of authority for what he has written from Joyce himself. To describe the music in a bit more detail, here's Anthony Burgess again. It will be more like There are a variety of traditional styles of music in Blooms of Dublin. There are a number of what might be thought of as character songs by the leads, Leopold Bloom, Molly Bloom, Stephen Dedalus and Blazes Boylan. There are several slow ballads, and there are comic up-tempo chorus numbers. As Burgess suggests, there are also subtle and complex effects through both the music and the lyrics that lend the whole a more serious quality than might be expected from most stage musicals, but the aim, as with all of Burgess's work on Joyce, is to make the material more or less accessible and entertaining. It certainly doesn't patronise the audience. So let's hear some of the songs. 
We recorded these new versions recently at the Burgess Foundation in Manchester with some fantastic musicians, directed by Richard Strivens and accompanied by David Jones, who's playing Anthony Burgess's own piano. Let's start with a song called Today, which celebrates the day on which Ulysses takes place, which is the 16th of June, 1904. The song is sung on a Dublin street. Leopold Bloom, a baritone, sings a relaxed ballad in which he anticipates meeting someone new on this otherwise ordinary day. Owen Gilhooley sings the part of Bloom. upon the breeze and hopes of early middle age. So it may just slip by in a routine way, leaving nothing to say but one model summary, one model summary day. about having to wear this black not right for heat black reflects refracts is it still etiquette is etiquette poor Dignam wonder what time the funeral is must get a paper that's what drink does for a man Ireland sober is Ireland stiff Hard to find anyone stiffer than poor Dignam. Still, he's sober now. Folk wisdom. Funeral livens up the day. Not a day to be dead on. Plenty of fleshy exposure. Nails and strawberries are red. Tucky peaches in a basket Racing on an asket In the royal enclosure Ted We'll see If there's anything else in store Let's be having it soon This 16th of June 1904 A.D. Leopold Bloom's wife is Molly Bloom, and she's a professional soprano singer. While Bloom is out in the street, she's waking up in bed, and her song, called Four O'Clock Tea, anticipates meeting her lover that afternoon. Her lover's blaze is boiling, but Bloom surprises her halfway through her song with her breakfast on a tray, and he's furious to learn that Boylan will be visiting. Rachel Croash sings the part of Molly. <laughs> Take shot. 
shop, or some other big shop, though he doesn't go for any fancy stuff, not any fancy stuff, is a bit rough, is a bit rough, he can't get enough of the sentimental song he'll be singing with me. to God. Breakfast. That gave me a start. You haven't worn black since... Dignam's funeral. Since poor little Rudy. At Glasnevin, is it? Put some flowers on his... Poor little... So you've been up then? For the post. Who's it from? Boylan. Uh, he's bringing the programme. Blazes Boylan! Just Boylan. a Boylan. song A bull. What's that you're muttering, Poldy? What are you going to sing in this programme? La Tisarem La Mano, duet with J.C. Doyle. And? Boylan, Boylan, Hayes is Boylan. Did you leave anything on the fire? The kidney! In that last piece, you can hear a fragment of Love's Old Sweet Song, which was a popular Victorian parlour song described in the novel Ulysses as being sung by Molly Bloom. Here's another example of Burgess's use of musical quotation. In this next song, Stephen Dedalus, who's visiting a brothel with Bloom, describes his adventures in Paris and the music moves from a gentle ballad to a lively cancan and back again. A part of Stephen is sung by Philip O'Connor.
The actor who played the speaking part of Stephen Dedalus in 1982 was Frank Grimes, and we were delighted to be able to speak to him about his memories of taking part in that production. Frank is a distinguished stage and screen actor. He came to prominence for his portrayal of the young Brendan Behan in the 1967 adaptation of Behan's autobiography, for which he was nominated for a Tony Award, and Frank has had a long career on the screen with roles in A Bridge Too Far, Strumpet City and Coronation Street. I spoke to Frank in May 2022. Um, it's, it's hard to believe that uh, we recorded Blooms of Dublin 40 years ago in 1982. So I, I was based in London then, but I had just received my green card and I was preparing to leave England for the States. But before that, I traveled back to my hometown of Dublin for the recording of uh, Blooms of Dublin. I had recently played Hamlet in London under the direction of uh, Lindsay Anderson at Stratford East, and which was good for playing Stephen Dedalus because Stephen is a Hamlet-esque character. I had played Stephen Dedalus before at the Abbey Theatre in a production of Ulysses in Night Town. I also remember that on that first morning, there was a delay in the first read through of the piece because the Irish actors, who were mostly made up of the radio, television, and repertory players, they had summoned the president of Irish Actors' Equity, Mr. Dermot Doolan, and he was holding a meeting because of a dispute. Though I didn't know it, uh, the nature of the grievance, I later found out that it was, in fact, because of me. I was the only actor brought over from London, and some of the actors were objecting to that fact. The repertory had recently recorded the complete Ulysses, and I guess they, they thought one of their own should be reading the part. The, the dispute with the Irish actors was settled when John Tidyman, our director, explained that uh, as this was a co-production between the BBC and Radio Television, and it was quite legal and proper that at least one actor from British Actors' Equity should participate. I, I was that member of British Actors' Equity. The incident seemed... Uh, <laughs> It seemed rather Joycean to me and, and a little bit insulting as I was, after all, in my hometown of Dublin. But I kind of resented being treated as a, a West Briton. During the recording of that, that week, Donald McCann, who was playing Bloom, uh, uh, whom I knew from the early days at the Abbey when we were together, he hardly spoke a word to me. When it was, when he did speak to me, it was to tell me that I had taken the English shilling, which was a bit ironic because uh, Donald himself had taken more than his share of the Sassanach shilling. During this delay, I, I was sitting with Anthony Burgess and his Italian wife making small talk. Um, I'd recently read his uh, shorter version of Finnegan's Wake. I told him I was planning a one man show on James Joyce. He asked me had I had any dealings with the grandson, Stephen James Joyce, who was the head of the Joyce estate. I told him, he told me that uh, Stephen James Joyce was a famously difficult man and that I would have trouble with him. He also told me that he, uh, he had asked the grandson how much he was making from his grandfather's royalties, but he refused to tell him. Yeah, Anthony Burgess, I remember, suggested that it would possibly be a, a six-figure sum. Now, I, I had recently made a film in Cinecita Studios in Rome, and I was sharing this with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Burgess. Um, he asked me, had I, had I learned any Italian while I was over there? And I replied that I, I had picked up a little, and uh, from the Italian crew, I could now swear like a Neapolitan in Italian. And I demonstrated it, at which point Mrs. Burgess, who was on the fringe of our conversation and not paying much attention, she gave me such a shocked look. I mean, all she heard was me telling the great man to fuck off in Italian. 
Years later, when I was preparing my one man show on Joyce, Lindsay Anderson, um, who was going to direct it, I understand he wrote to Anthony Burgess to ask him if he would be interested in writing the one man show. But he died before he received the letter, though I understand Mrs. Burgess replied to Lindsay's letter. By the way, Anthony Burgess was right. I did have a great deal of difficulty with Joyce's grandson. He was extremely intimidating and he threatened to sue me if I continued. I had to wait until Joyce's work was out of copyright before I could perform it. And incidentally, I am performing it at the Irish Cultural Centre here in London on Bloomsday next month. Thanks to Frank for sharing his memories of that time. The only complete rendition of Blooms of Dublin was this radio version from 1982, which, while generally regarded as a critical success, has never been revived. Reviewers praised the lively songs of Burgess's handling of the complex text. Burgess received lots of encouragement from people such as the TV presenter and writer on classical music Sir Humphrey Burton, and also Joyce's biographer Richard Ellman. They both wrote to him with their praise for the endeavour. Some people didn't like it, of course, notably Burgess's great enemy, the critic and musicologist Hans Keller. Keller dismissed the whole thing in the magazine The Listener as incompetent, aimless nonsense. Burgess contented himself with sketching out a musical response, which has never been published or performed, a homage to Hans Keller for four tubers with three colossal fortissimo blasts, producing a flatulent fanfare, perhaps appropriate to Keller's pomposity. Anyway, all that aside, there's much to enjoy in the full musical, and it's a shame that it's never been staged. I don't think that you need to be a Joyce scholar to enjoy it. There are some excellent catchy songs, and there are poignant moments and strong characters, and plenty of Joycean, not to say Burgessian, humour and wordplay. I think Burgess succeeds in his aim of making Ulysses available to the audience. Even if not all the illusions are immediately obvious, the whole is by turns a moving, absurd, serious and funny piece of work that hangs together as a coherent whole. Let's end at the end. The final scene of Ulysses is well known. It's a virtuoso monologue with no punctuation by Molly Bloom in which she reflects on her life and loves. Burgess matches this with a 17 minute long solo number for Molly that reprises many of the numbers of the play and mixes them with new material. Here's just an extract from the famous conclusion. in my hair like the Andalusian girls used? Or shall I wear a red? Yes. And how he kissed me under the Moorish wall. And I thought as well him as another. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again. Yes. To say yes, my mountain flower. And first I put my arms around him. Yes. And drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume yes and his heart was going like mad and yes I said yes I will
Thanks again to Owen Gilhooley, Rachel Croash, Philip O'Connor, Richard Strivens, and everyone who took part in making these new recordings. These will be presented more fully as part of an exhibition about Anthony Burgess and James Joyce, which will take place next year. This will be in Manchester and in Dublin. Look out for all that, and look out for our other podcasts on Anthony Burgess, James Joyce, and Ulysses as we celebrate its anniversary year. Don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast. For more about Anthony Burgess and to find out how you can support the work of the Burgess Foundation, visit www.anthonyburgess.org.